Welcome to Physician Perspectives. I'm Dr. Jeetan Bendo. I'll be talking about sleep deprivation. My impression of a present day sleep scenario is that we are a sleep deprived society. Sleep deprivation is what I see in a lot of my patients and friends. So let me start by defining sleep deprivation. Let's start by defining insomnia. But before we get to that point, I'd like to point out that the source for all slides and presentations are available at the bottom of the slide. You can visit these places. These are all public uh, domains where you can, from where you can download the files. Insomnia is now called insomnia disorder. It's, it's classified under the sleep-wake disorders. Um, the, the definition goes as following. It's a, pr a predominant complaint of dissatisfaction with sleep, quantity or quality associated with one or more of the following. One, difficulty initiating sleep. Two, difficulty maintaining sleep, characterized by frequent awakenings or problems returning to sleep after awakenings. Or three, early morning awakening with inability to return to sleep. And all of these, D, uh, should be present for at least three months. So in sleep deprivation, you do not get enough sleep. So while both insomnia and sleep deprivation involve failing to get enough sleep, experts in the science make a distinction between the two. People with insomnia have trouble sleeping even when they have plenty of time to sleep. On the other hand, people with sleep deprivation don't have enough time allocated for sleep as a result of behavioral choices or everyday obligations. So in sleep deprivation, you don't get enough sleep. You do, not have you do not have a sleep disorder that prevents you from getting enough sleep or causes poor quality sleep. It's just the question of time allocation and the ambience of the environment that, that is conducive to sleep. While I was trying to uh, improve or broaden my definition of sleep deprivation, I came across this paper, Sleep Deprivation and the Workplace Prevalence, Impact and Solutions, a good paper where they've also looked into cognitive behavioral therapy of CBT for sleep challenges. What I was interested in, 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 in another broadening of the definition by calling this uh, kind of sleep deprivation as insufficient sleep syndrome. But for the sake of the presentation and for the sake of sanity, my sanity, I would like to stick to sleep deprivation for now. So how much sleep do we need? Now that depends on age. So newborns need 14 to 17 hours, infants 12 to 15, toddlers 11 to 14, preschoolers 10 to 13, school aged children 9 to 11 hours, teenagers that is who are between 14 and 17 years need 8 to 10 hours of sleep, young adults 7 to 9 hours, adults 7 to 9 hours and old adults 7 to 8 hours. So we know how much sleep we need but is this really a problem? Are there any indicators to show that this is seriously a problem? Interestingly, Fitbit, the makers of activity trackers and wearables, released a survey data in 2016 based on aggregated and anonymized data from users from 18 countries. So here is a list of the countries that they looked into and they reported that Japan has, is the most sleep deprived nation globally uh, with an average of a, a Japanese getting 6 hours and 35 minutes of sleep. Now compare that to New Zealand which has the best sleep scores at 7 hours and 25 minutes. That's some good data that we can look into. Following the release of such uh, interesting and important data, you see headlines like this uh, splashed over publications in different countries. So what's the economic cost of insufficient sleep? This data shows that in the US, or the US sustains by far the highest economic losses, that's up to 411 billion a year, which is 2.28% of its GDP. And Japan, <coughs> which loses 138 billion a year, which is 
5% of its GDP. These are large numbers. So school age children need 9 to 11 hours of sleep. However, this publication by the CDC shows that most of our school children are sleep deprived and only a small percentage, that's 9% of the boys and 8% of girls are getting enough sleep. So naturally there's a question now, does sleep deprivation cause disease? The short answer to that question is yes, it does cause disease. So I'll just present a few slides on that. This is an article published in an open access journal titled Role of Sleep Deprivation in Immune-Related Disease Risk and Outcomes. Sleep deprivation increases inflammatory cytokine levels in the blood, uh, which get into the systemic circulation and naturally travel around the body and work on different kinds of cells in the body and the tissue they you know, distribute themselves uh, among and cause many challenges such as cancer, infection, neurodegeneration and cardiovascular disease. Here is an interesting table which, uh, which, puts, which has put together different uh, publications and they all look at the effects of recovery sleep on sleep deprivation induced changes in the immune and uh, inflammatory parameters. So various subjects are put on various protocols. Uh, please note that these protocols were short. They're not like what we have in real life, which could be days and months. Um, and they also noted the different types of uh, challenges these sleep deprivation protocols induced on the subjects. They looked at the, uh, the recovery of these immune parameters after a sleep recovery protocol. The take-home message is that even with these short deprivation product, sleep deprivation protocols, the recovery is not necessarily complete. They, and some of the recovery is, is not even picked up, it's not detected. So in real life, this could be even worse. And we really have to look at this very seriously and take it you know, to heart. When we look at infections compared with long sleep duration, short sleep duration is associated with an increased risk of common illnesses, cold, flu, gastroenteritis and other common infectious diseases. Patients with sleep disorders, you know, they exhibit a 1.2 fold greater increase of herpes zoster. Sleep deprivation may exert detrimental effects on sepsis induced multi-organ damage. Post-vaccination challenges. This is very important. Habitual short sleep duration compared with longer sleep duration was associated with reduced long-term clinical protection after vaccination. This is important because when we take vaccines, we've got to make sure that the vaccine works well. And so sleep is pretty much central there. The immune system is central when it comes to keeping cancers at bay. So keeping the immune system up and running is very important. Now, sleep deprivation has increasingly been recognized as a risk factor for impaired anti-tumor response. And there has been a, a lot of significant associations between short sleep duration and cancers like breast cancer, colorectal cancer and prostate cancer. Now one of the potential mechanisms behind the induction of these cancers is because of uh, the shorter duration of sleep and the shorter secretion, duration of secretion of a very important hormone called as melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone of darkness and I will certainly be talking about melatonin in some other presentations. Now melatonin has anti-cancer properties and these uh, anti-cancer properties keep ma many of our cancers at bay. So keeping s sleep central is central to keeping the immune system up and running. Neurodegenerative diseases. Low grade neuroinflammation and activation of astrocytes and microglia is observed in the hippocampus and piriform cortex regions of the brain in chronic sleep deprived patients. The brain, like all other organs, collects waste products and these accumulate over time during wakefulness and neural activity. The clearance happens mainly during sleep. So sleep is very important 
uh, to, to make sure that these products are not accumulated in the brain. Accumulation of such products like beta amyloid and plaque, for plaque are very typical when it comes to pathological uh, changes in diseases like Alzheimer's disease. Sleep deprivation can also induce autoimmune diseases or can enhance autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, systemic lupus erythematosus or SLE and systemic sclerosis. This interesting original article, melatonin in the colon modulates intestinal microbiota in response to stress and sleep deprivation. So basically sleep deprivation changes or puts stress on the microbiota, the bacteria and the viruses in our, in our gut. That causes intestinal dysbiosis. So melatonin is a central um, a kind of a character which, which plays an important role in keeping some of the good bacteria up and running which is important for for various uh, challenges. It is also important for the immune system because one of the largest immune systems in the body called as the GALT or gut associated lymphoid tissue resides in the gut. So keeping the gut happy is central to the immune system as well. What about metabolic and vascular diseases? Sleep deprivation is associated with the with a high incidence of fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular outcomes with a 48% higher risk of coronary heart disease, 15% higher risk of stroke and 12% increased risk of all-cause mortality. This paper titled Sleep Duration and Myocardial Infarction published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology has one simple take-home message. Short duration of sleep increases the risk of developing acute myocardial infarction or heart attack and healthy sleep duration may be cardioprotective for people with a genetic predisposition to coronary heart disease or coronary disease. So this image here says one additional hour of sleep can reduce the risk of myocardial infarction by 20%. What about metabolic and vascular diseases? Sleep deprivation increases the risk for obesity, almost 55% higher risk. That is big considering that we have an obesity epidemic right now. It increases the risk for insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes mellitus. That is also big because insulin resistance is the undercurrent or the challenge that precipitates type 2 diabetes mellitus. So it is important to keep that insulin resistance under control as well as increases the risk for hypertension. Sleep loss or sleep deprivation can increase the risk for diabetes by altering glucose metabolism, upregulating appetite or reducing energy expenditure which lead to weight gain, insulin resistance and therefore diabetes. When healthy lean subjects are subjected to sleep deprivation for a couple of days, there is a change in their hunger pattern. There's an increase in ghrelin, increase in hunger, increase in appetite, increase in appetite for high carbohydrate food as well as increase in appetite for other type of foods. I've not spoken about some of the consequences that have been listed here, but let's just go through this briefly. So at the central nervous system, there is an increase in irritability, cognitive impairment, memory lapse or loss, impaired judgment, decreased creativity, increased stress, constant yawning, inability to focus and concentrate and hallucinations. At the GI system or gastrointestinal system, impaired immune system because of the GALT that resides in the immune in the gut, digestive issues, acidity, leaky gut. Uh, at the cardiovascular system, heart attacks, strokes, hypertension, impaired heart rate variability. At the endocrine system, it can cause insulin resistance and so diabetes, obesity, growth suppression and increased appetite. At the musculoskeletal system, it can impair reaction time, decrease accuracy, increase tremors, 
aches and people can be accident prone. The other risks being risk of cancers, increased risk of, risk of inflammation and increased infections. I would like to conclude this presentation by quoting a prominent interventional cardiologist who was interviewed recently. He said, a large number of young patients have had a heart attack or a stroke or have been diagnosed with diabetes, hypertension or even cancer. Many factors may lead to such diseases, but sleep deprivation is one that is least talked of. I cannot agree more with this interventional cardiologist. Thank you.